So I did 10 reasons why it could be justified to eat meat. So of course I have to do the opposite, 10 reasons why it wouldn't be, or I guess 10 excuses, common excuses that people give for eating meat. Some are pretty simple, pretty obvious, I think, but others are a little bit more complex and I think worth talking about. So we'll start with the obvious one. Meat tastes good, so it is good. Plenty of things taste good or feel good. It doesn't mean that it's right to do them, obviously, if it hurts others. I mean, I'm sure long pig, human, <laughs> I'm sure that human tastes pretty good if it's properly prepared, so. Yeah, the only way that this argument works is if the activity in question is victimless, right? And uh, meat pretty clearly isn't. I named this channel Unnatural Vegan for a reason. Just because something is natural doesn't mean that it's necessarily good, and just because something is unnatural doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad. We can pretty easily think of unnatural man-made things that are pretty good, pretty useful. Toilets? On the other hand, a lot of bad things have been with us like since the beginning. I'm not saying that nature is inherently evil or anything like that, but a lot of natural things are, are pretty terrible, right? So whether or not something is natural is just not a justification to continue doing something when we don't need to. As I covered in my last video, there are people in developing countries where nutrition is a legitimate issue, obviously, just due to lack of food or a variety of foods. But it can also be an issue for those in developed countries, places like the US, due to uh, having a certain illness or an allergy or disability. But for people without those barriers, there's just no reason to consume meat or any animal product. We can get everything we need from a variety of plant foods and some supplements like B12. Some people complain that veganism is fine for, you know, your average Joe, for regular people, but that it's not suitable for, you know, bodybuilders, uh, powerlifters, people who need more protein. And there may be some, you know, theoretical advantage when it comes to something like branch chain amino acids, which are in higher amounts in animal products, but you can always supplement for that. And many meat eating lifters do that anyway. Regardless, Nobody needs to be a bodybuilder or a power lifter. It's fine if that's what people are into. But I mean, that brings us back to hedonism, right? You can't use that as an excuse for harming animals. You know, if you're going to choose a recreation, maybe choose a victimless one or at least a less harmful one, or at least do it in the least harmful way possible, right? By not eating meat and instead relying on supplements that, let's be honest, you're probably going to consume anyway. You're probably already going to be consuming protein powders and creatine and whatever else anyway. So what advantage you really think that the meat is giving you at that point is kind of beyond me, but okay. This one is really aggravating to me, I'm not gonna lie. It's often stated in a kind of racist way. Stereotyping like Native Americans, for instance, as spiritual healers who need to kill animals in order to stay connected to their ancestors or whatever. It's, I don't know, comparing them to like lions or something. Yeah, super cool. I'm sure they really appreciate it. Virtually every culture has a history of eating meat, as well as a history of activists who have recognized this as a problem and who have dealt with it in unique ways, you know, within the context of their cultural heritage. The same way it's happened with women's rights or slavery. White cultures have obviously struggled with these issues too, and obviously continue to do so. Culture is not static. Cultures change, they evolve, hopefully for the better, as they abandon bad practices that people have continued to justify as culture, whether we're talking about slavery or sexism or public stoning, or yes, eating meat. There are plenty of people living in situations with limited access to vegan food, and that can be caused by culture, by the culture that they live in, but it's the situation that's the excuse, not the culture. There are even situations where the cultural norm results in shaming, or even worse, for people who refuse to eat meat. This is not like a charming quality of a culture that should be celebrated and preserved. It's a sign of a culture that is socially regressive and needs to be reformed, at least in that aspect. I think we should have enough respect 
for different cultures to recognize the people from those cultures as people, as rational thinking beings who can change, who can recognize that whatever practice, whatever tradition they have is wrong and stop doing it. And the whole like cultural imperialism thing, please learn a little bit of history. Like, do y'all really think that white people invented vegetarianism? <laughs> like, yeah, veganism is culturally neutral and secular in nature, but obviously the people who like founded the vegan society were heavily inspired by Eastern culture, Eastern philosophy, Eastern spiritual beliefs. Good ideas and good science can come from anywhere. The point is that no matter how inextricably linked we think meat is to our identities, we can change. We aren't a slave to the culture, whatever culture we happen to grow up in, and changing our minds about something, no longer practicing something that is part of our culture, doesn't mean that we're abandoning who we are or betraying those around us. Religion is a lot like culture, but the rules of religion claim to be inherently uh, good or bad for everyone. It's not a subjective thing. Oh, you grew up in this culture and you do this, so it's okay for you to do that. No, no, no. Everyone should do this thing or should not do this thing. And it also typically carries a threat of some sort of supernatural consequence. It's hard not to be a little bit sympathetic towards someone who's truly terrified of going to hell and being tortured for all eternity for violating some sort of religious mandate until you realize that there's literally zero credible evidence for any particular religion, nor is there any sound logical argument for why someone should prefer one particular religion over another. Religion is a matter of faith and faith is a matter of choice. Every single day, people choose to have faith in one particular version over another. And when that choice is to have faith in a religion that advocates bigotry or harm towards others or is indifferent to it, that's the wrong choice. You can make the argument for there being very strong psychological barriers to abandoning the idea of an afterlife, but there are plenty of religions and sects of religions that do not celebrate bigotry and see kindness to animals as a virtue. Every major religion has vegetarians and vegans, and many even have vegans in their clergy. While only a few Catholic clergy are vegan or vegetarian, protection and respect for animals is being given increased attention, with very supportive comments from even several popes. You can find a lot more variation among Protestants, but even among evangelicals, there are vegan pastors. With Judaism, support is even more overt, with this rabbinic statement signed by over 70 rabbis. Vegan is being touted as the new kosher by advocates who are taking into account the underlying purposes of kosher law and the circumstances of modern day life. Islam is a little different. There's this common misconception that sacrifice is required in commemoration of Abraham's you know, willingness to sacrifice his son. It doesn't come from the Quran, it comes from other texts, and this interpretation is debatable. Regardless, there are many vegan Muslims and a strong argument for nearly all Muslims being at least tentatively vegan based on the lack of truly halal meat. Sikhism is split based on the sect, um, whether eating meat is permissible or whether it goes against Sikh beliefs. I don't think I need to go into Buddhism or Hinduism. While most are not vegetarian, they have well-known traditions of abstaining from meat, and mainstream interpretations agree that it is virtuous to abstain from harm to animals. The point is that finding a religion where veganism or vegetarianism isn't at least commendable is hard. So whether you choose to hide behind your dogma with some anti-vegan interpretation, or you choose to be inspired by your faith and to fight for progressive change, that's on you. Religion is not an excuse for causing harm to others, and if you turn it into that, all you're doing is slandering your faith and turning away open-minded and compassionate people. Hunting is presented as though the ways in which it's different from factory farming make it justifiable. The hunters are doing it themselves and are therefore more respectful of the animal's sacrifice. Um, they're using up all of the animal, they aren't wasting it. 
it's necessary for population control. Just a little aside, as I said in the other video, this doesn't apply to people who literally can't afford to do anything else in their situation. Um, it also more controversially may not apply to invasive species. These have their own justifications. Again, I talked about them in the other video. First, respect. Does it really matter to anyone? Like, if, if you're murdered by someone, does it really matter to you if they were respectful in whatever way that they deem respectful? Like, they said a prayer or something before hunting you down? This doesn't make any sense unless you think the prayer like actually sent the animal to heaven or that the animal gave you permission to kill it or something. Again, see the last section. Hunters aren't respecting the animal's sacrifice. The animal is not making a sacrifice. The hunter is taking that animal's life. Saying thanks after stealing something, something that wasn't yours to begin with, and then pre pretending that it wasn't stealing, it just seems like adding insult to injury. It is the opposite of respect. Second, not wasting the animal. People assume, I don't know, that farmers are idiots or that the corporations that own these farms and ultimately run these farms are idiots. Corporations are nothing but efficient and farmers cannot afford to waste. Everything from blood to bones is ground up and reused in agriculture. Now when it comes to the consumer side, that's different. People do waste a lot of what they buy. But how much do you want to bet that a lot of unconsumed hunted meat goes to waste too? And for the hunters, it's very likely that the production side, that the harvesting of this animal is also very wasteful. It's more likely that large portions of the animal are being wasted or underutilized simply because the hunter does not have the infrastructure in place to make use of them. Unless your average hunter has a bone grinding machine in his shed. Finally, population control. This is actually a very profitable myth for land management organizations. The people who sell hunting licenses are highly incentivized to maximize populations of hunted animals like deer in order to sell as many licenses as possible. They can range from around $20 to over $100. Across the board, it's something a lot of hunters complain about, but these agencies rely on these fees. When populations are below demand, they'll clear trees to make areas that yield grass and edge environments between grass and forests where deer like to hang out, which increases growth and fertility. The USDA actually publishes documents complete with diagrams to show how to maximize deer environments. As a consequence of this and other human actions, the population of white-tailed deer here in the US is higher than it's ever been in recorded history. When it's done by land management for hunting purposes, it's a form of animal agriculture like any other, just with a different means of sale and harvesting and run by the state. It's also not without its consequences to the climate since deer are ruminants just like cows and burp methane just like cows. Arguably worse per yield of meat because animals that forage, they grow more slowly, they have lower carcass weights than feedlot finished cows. But what about controlling populations in forest abutting suburbs? Ultimately, the most reliable way to do it is to control food sources, but if that can't be done fast enough or effectively, there are non-lethal methods to control deer population. The Humane Society has pioneered the use of a vaccine contraceptive for deer, and it has been approved by the EPA. There's no reason to think we have to hunt deer or that hunting is justified in light of modern technology. Okay, it's marginally better. <laughs> Where's my dang sweatshirt? Regenerative agriculture, as it's used in defense of meat, is the claim that we need grazing cattle to save the planet because it captures CO2 and restores the soil. You know, the Alan Savory guy. These claims broadly demonize plant agriculture as destructive, despite grazing being a main contributor to desertification and cattle being a major contributor to climate change. But wait, they'll say, that's not true. Regenerative agriculture, if they did it right and followed these arbitrary, not at all evidence-based rules, then it would have restored the soil somehow, in some way. It's no true Scotsman, right? Make a bold claim and then say that any counterexample isn't really a counterexample because it's not really the thing that you're talking about. You can never prove it wrong because they'll just keep moving the goalposts and saying that whatever 
it is you're claiming is the thing that didn't work, well, it wasn't really the thing, right? It's not really regenerative agriculture. Meanwhile, never providing any real evidence for their claims. There are a number of studies on this issue that have debunked these claims. And of course, the scientific consensus is that beef in particular, however it's produced, is a leading driver in climate change. Some amounts of carbon can be sequestered by some grazing practices on some land, but they can also be released by bad management and the soil's capacity for holding carbon is limited. Once it reaches an equilibrium, it stops sequestering more carbon, but the methane emissions remain. Sequestration from good management only slightly reduces the impact of grazing. It does not eliminate it, and it certainly doesn't reverse it. You dummies. <laughs> you just want so badly for this to be true. It's, it's a religion at this point. It's a really weird, really sad religion. This is a nice summary from the Food Climate Research Network. They clearly break down all of the misconceptions of regenerative agriculture, from the myth of manure as a source of nitrogen, to the idea that it makes for a reliable form of carbon sequestration to fight climate change. It doesn't. When you follow actual studies and look at the scientific consensus, it is clear that plant-based diets are just better for the environment. Saving the environment with meat just isn't a thing. Unless you're talking about, like, oysters and insects, then you may have an argument. Speciesism is the discrimination of another based solely on species. That's not to say there aren't other reasons for different treatment, but if that were the real reason, then meat eaters would have no problem eating, say, very young children who have a similar level of self-awareness to farmed animals. And yes, farmed animals are sentient, or conscious, or whatever you want to call it. That is not something that vegans made up. It is overwhelming consensus among the relevant scientific fields. Speciesist arguments just come down to we're human and they aren't. And, and that's it. Morality only protects humans. Non-humans are not protected. They are not considered. And so we can do with them what we like. But of course, you know, most people don't think it's okay to just kill a dog. So yeah, they're not... <laughs> They're not always the most consistent. The obvious problem with this is that it allows for any arbitrary discrimination. You might as well say that morality only protects white dudes. It's ultimately just selfish, right? <laughs> I mean, we don't respect animals and we don't value them because it's easier not to. They taste good. People advocating for social contract as an excuse aren't hard to miss, although it's not always clear what they mean by that? Do they mean that whatever laws a society holds, that's that's the thing? That's what's moral? It's fine as long as it's legal? Probably not. And I don't think I have to explain how obviously wrong that is. Are they appealing to some idealized form of social contract? When they are, it seems to have a pretty inconsistent cutoff, rational agent, aka human, even though, again, young children or the intellectually disabled have similar levels of rational agency to the animals that they eat. This is just speciesism again. Arguably, the real way to apply an ideal, objective social contract is to follow something like John Rawls' Veil of Ignorance, minus the speciesism. Imagine you are in charge of creating a society without knowing who or what you will be in that society. You could be white, you could be a minority, you could be a man, a woman, a cow, a pig, a chicken, an oyster. If you end up an oyster or something else that's not sentient, then someone hurting you or eating you probably not gonna bother you, right? So having protection doesn't really make sense. If you end up a chicken or some other sentient being, we can say that, yeah, it really would bother you. And so maybe it makes sense that a chicken has the right not to be killed. But maybe a chicken wouldn't be too bothered by, like, not being allowed to drive a car or to own property. <laughs> Obviously, if you ended up a human, you'd have a lot more interest in those rights and a lot of other rights that a chicken, you know, wouldn't really give a shit about. The bottom line is that all of the reasonable thought experiments that really try to design a rational and objective ideal social contract come to the same conclusion. There's no justification for what we're doing to animals and social contract does not justify eating meat. 
Saving the best for last. I shouldn't have to address this one, but there are people who really do believe it or say they believe it so they don't have to alter their lifestyles. There's no evidence that plants feel pain. An uncontrolled experiment by an ex-CIA interrogator hooking plants up to a lie detector test and deciding they're psychic doesn't count. There's a great article on that here. In terms of the field of plant neurobiology and the crazy claims that its proponents make, yeah, no. This is a critical paper authored by dozens of experts in botany, plant sciences, and molecular biology. Plants are not intelligent. Describing what they do as feeling is totally deceptive. They react unconsciously and automatically, similar to how our skin reacts to the sun by tanning. There's no evidence that anything about these reactions is conscious or intelligent or would even need to be so. Being rooted in place, plants have very limited ability to react to the environment. The simplest animals demonstrating some level of sentience or consciousness through fairly uncontroversial intentional acts are insects. Non-associative learning like habituation or only classical conditioning don't clearly indicate any existence of a mental state. Again, plants don't have feelings. They have instrumental value by being useful to things that do have feelings, right? Their food and their shelter even, they're pretty. But none of this even really matters in terms of the argument because animal agriculture results in more plant damage anyway. If you did care about plants for some strange reason, it would still make sense to eat them directly rather than eating the animals who have had to be fed far more of them. Only eating lower on the food chain, consuming a vegan diet, reduces overall animal biomass and effect on plants. So that's it. I really hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe, support the channel, patreon.com slash unnatural vegan, and I will have a new video hopefully soon. I don't know what I'm working on next, which always kind of sucks. <laughs> it's always a little bit stressful, I guess. Sound like I said feed feed lot finish? Feed lot finished. Feed lot I can't. Feed lot feed lot finished. Talking is hard, you know? You realize that when you have to do it for a living. <laughs> like putting S at the end of shit, like a T S ghosts. Ghosts sects. I've tried my best to say singular version in the religion part because se I just say sex. Religious sex. <laughs> Religious sects. 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 That sounds dumb. Religious sex. Boring and unproductive? No, I guess it'd be boring and productive, right? Because you would. The, the point would be production. Got it. Nailed it.